The heart of New York beats with the Grand Central Station. It spans over 49 acres, with its own hospital and tennis courts, and handles over eight times the population of London every year. It's no doubt the Grand Central is easily classed as the largest and most famous station in the world. The Grand Central Terminus was created following a need for a central hub for three major railroads. The Hudson River Railroad, the New York and Harlem Railroad and the New York and New Haven Railroad. The Harlem Railroad was the first to operate and the first report of a railroad structure was a maintenance shed that the railroads exclusively used. The Harlem Railroad was forced to move operations following the banning of steam engines in Lower Manhattan. The railroads were forced to move north to Union Square near Madison Square. As the Harlem was travelling north, the New Haven Railroad was travelling south. Soon both railroads met at the maintenance shed, the two lines were expanded and soon they shared a sizeable yard where the shed stood. In 1863, the Hudson Railroad stock was being snapped up by Cornelius Vanderbilt, a steamboat operator on the Hudson River, and in just 12 short months, he controlled the whole railroad itself. Vanderbilt wanted to merge the railroads, but a steamboat competitor by the name of Daniel Drew saw the venture as a threat to his company, and bribed the legislators to stop the proposals. After being successful, Drew planned to short sell the stock of the Harlem and New York, but this plan only helped strengthen Vanderbilt's profits when he bought as much as he could and the profits soared. With Drew out of the way, Vanderbilt was free to be crowned president of all three railroads and he successfully merged the Hudson and New York Central. But Vanderbilt retained their separate lines and he decided to keep the Harlem independent and built connecting lines along the river to the Bronx. Vanderbilt was pleased with his venture, and upon the expansion of the Harlem Line, he proposed a union for the railroads at a single station as a replacement for the many stations that each railroad served. He concluded that the simple maintenance shed and yard would be the perfect terminus for a Grand Central Depot. Of course, the simple wooden shed simply wouldn't do for a Grand Depot, so Vanderbilt commissioned self-taught architect John B. Snook for his new building. The location of the depot in many eyes was not really suited as the area was quite underdeveloped, but like Houston Station, Vanderbilt knew that what a railway could do for the area and was backing on businesses springing up around him. Construction started in 1869 and was completed in a quick two years with all three railroads using the station by the end of 1871. Taking inspiration from many international stations and even the Louvre in Paris, the new depot facilitated the passengers on the lower ground and the railroad offices on the upper. Three waiting rooms, four restaurants, a new billiards room and even a police station were all available to the paying customers. The new depot catered for the engines as well, with a new and impressive train shed and a full host of station pilots to accommodate the 12 separate tracks and storage for over 150 cars. It was the largest depot in the world and the largest open space in the States. Despite the investment and seemingly good fortune, the 12 newly laid tracks were very deadly. Seven people died within two weeks of the depot's opening from crossings that intersected the roads to the station. Vanderbilt proposed that the problematic tracks be covered over and overpasses be built to accommodate the road traffic. The new underground services did prevent accidents and despite the rocky start, the new depot was running at its full capacity much quicker than the architects expected. It was forced to expand and add a further five platforms, typically serving commuters directly into the city's heart. By the turn of the 19th century, the depot had once again reached its capacity. The depot was forced to expand yet again. A further three storeys were added, the waiting rooms were merged and a new foyer was added too. As women were travelling more and more on the railway, a new woman's waiting room was created. The tracks got an upgrade with a new reconfiguration and a new pneumatic switching system was added. Upon its opening in 1900, the depot was renamed to the Grand Central Station. Despite its new style, the public were less than impressed. 
The station was caked in years of filth and soot and the fixtures that were considered so grand and opulent had lost its appeal, but it still catered for a train every 45 seconds. An accident in 1902 would change the station forever. The approach to the station through Park Avenue Tunnel was very smoky and filthy with the engine soot and grime. An inbound express train was awaiting clearance into the station. It was unknown why the train wasn't cleared to enter, and despite several warning signals warning that the track was blocked, a local train missed those signals and smashed straight into the back of the express. When firefighters descended into the tunnel, they found what could be only described as a horror story. Many people who had survived the initial impact were scalded to death by the broken steam pipes and burst boilers. Two back coaches were unrecognisable, and the rescue efforts were hampered by the cra cramped, hot and dark conditions. In all, 15 people were killed, and 36 people were injured, and it remains one of the worst railroad accidents in New York. The engineer of the local, who had amazingly survived the crash, advised a coroner that due to the poor lighting and the conditions within the tunnel, signal visibility was nil. He felt he was unable to complain due to his employer's influence. The coroner placed blame on the crash solely on the shoulders of the railroad. The engineer still felt the crush of the railroad's might when they took him to court for corporate manslaughter, but he was ultimately exonerated. Even though no one was punished for the incident, it was wholly concluded that it was ultimately preventable and the cause was due to the lack of visibility of the signals and the signals within the tunnel were filthy and covered in soot. William J. Wilgus had seen the issues before the accident and had proposed changes to the lines and electrification of the trains as early as 1899. If William's proposal had been adopted, it is conceivable that the accident may, ne may have been prevented. As it was, William's proposal was re-examined, and he added more to the proposal. William wanted a whole new station, the elimination of all railroad crossings, and to straighten lines, to cover the, the cutting over Park Avenue, and finally all the changes would be superimposed over the existing building, giving a new 12-storey station. William's proposal would cost over $34 million and almost all of the proposals were actually accepted. The new station needed to be grand and modern for the time and the invitations for the design for the new station were sent to four major architects who battled for the tender. Ultimately, the job was given to the company Reed and Stem. The company was experienced engineers, but since Reed was in fact the brother-in-law of William, can be conceived that they had a slightly bigger advantage over the others. One of the more unusual parts of the plan was the inclusion of air rights above the tracks. Air rights was a new concept at the time, as the railroad owned the underground tracks. They also purchased the right to the air above them. Air rights are as valuable as rights on the ground. Companies can purchase air rights above their own ground or buildings. The purchasing of air rights could also prevent competitors from building unusually tall buildings blocking views of condos or high-rise apartments and offices and decreasing their own building's value. The railway had control over what sort of buildings could be placed over their railroads and they could sell off the air rights for considerable fees. William Vanderbilt Cornelius' grandson as for a joint architectural partnership with the company Warrant and Wetmore, and being a person he was, and the fact that Warren was Vanderbilt's cousin, of course both architects were appointed. The relationship started in 1904. Reed and Stem were tasked with the overall design, while Warren and Wetmore concentrated on the outer exterior. The collaboration was overseen by Charles Reed. The final proposal was massive, the largest the world had ever seen. New waiting rooms, two new concourses connected by ramps, new massive ladies and gents waiting rooms, new smoking rooms, and a whole range of facilities that were to cater for the all passengers and the footprint itself spanned over 19 blocks. It wasn't easy having four architects working on a singular project. 
Warren and Wetmore wanted the removal of the massive 12-storey tower and the vehicle roadways surrounding the building that had been part of Reed and Stem's plan. The New Haven Railroad, who was backing the project, objected to the tower's removal, but also the elaborate design due to costs. Eventually, the companies came to an agreement, and the tower was removed, but foundations were laid to provision for it, and the elevated vehicle viaducts were restored. Before the plans were completed and approved, Reed passed away in 1911. Wetmore seized the opportunity, and before Reed had even settled in his grave, he met with the New York Central in secret. He persuaded the board to sign just him and Wetmore as sole architects to the project, and stole the proposal under Stems and Reed's nose, and took full credit. We are now up to the point of construction, so come back for part two where we look at how the building was rebuilt into the station we know today, and we look at some of the more peculiar aspects of this new, unique station, and how the air rights saved the station from its ultimate destruction. <laughs>